The Israeli Air Force has pounded Hamas targets across Gaza, hitting over 50 targets in the past 24 hours. This says the army continues to facilitate the movement of civilians to safe areas and unlimited international humanitarian aid. There are no signs that the IDF plans to halt operations for Ramadan due to begin on Sunday. More on this from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. War in Gaza, day 152. And across Gaza, the Israeli Air Force carried out strikes against more than 50 Hamas targets over the past day. The targets included rocket launching positions, weapons depots, tunnel shafts, and other infrastructure. Earlier, the IDF released video of the destruction and sealing of the largest Hamas attack tunnel found in Gaza, which the military initially revealed in December during its offensive against the Palestinian terror group and briefly reported on yesterday. Parts of the tunnel were blown up by combat engineers with the IDF and Defense Ministry later pumping concrete into the remaining underground passages. The IDF says its 98th Division, operating in the Hamad Town residential complex in southern Gaza's Khan Yunus, captured dozens of terror operatives. The division's commando brigade had been raiding Hamas sites in the neighborhood where troops seized a large amount of weapons. The army also facilitated the evacuation of civilians from the area and nabbed dozens of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad gunmen who tried to flee along with civilians. The United States military, in coordination with Jordan, Egypt, and France, airdropped more than 36,000 meals into northern Gaza, the second such delivery of aid that Washington has led since Saturday, when the U.S. dropped some 38,000 meals. The U.S. military said airdrops by the U.S. and other countries are aimed to provide essential relief to civilians affected by the ongoing conflict. The U.S. is urging Israel to maximize every possible means to boost aid to Gaza. Israel has to maximize every possible means, every possible method of getting assistance to people who need it. The United States will continue to strongly support those efforts, along with many other countries around the world. But it requires more crossings, it requires more aid getting in, and once that aid is in, it requires making sure it can get to the people who need it. So we will continue to press that every single day because the situation as it stands is simply unacceptable. And on the northern front, as cross-border fighting between the IDF and Hezbollah continues, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant says that Israel is nearing its military operation in southern Lebanon. A barrage of rockets was fired toward Kiryat Shmona as Gallant was meeting Special U.S. Envoy Amos Hochstein amid efforts to avoid escalation into war. More on this from ILTV's William Sharon. The Hezbollah terror group fired a large barrage of some 30 rockets at the northern Israeli city of Kiryat Shmona, in what it said was a response to the deadly Israeli Defense Force airstrikes in southern Lebanon earlier in that day. At least 10 of the projectiles that were fired at Kiryat Shmona were successfully intercepted by the Iron Dome air defense system. One rocket struck the yard of a home in the nearby community of Kfar Blum, causing minor damage. The remainder of the rockets hit open areas, and there were no reports of injuries. The IDF responded by hitting a building used by Hezbollah, as well as an additional infrastructure in a Hezbollah command center. The latest cross-border exchanges after Gallant met U.S. Special Envoy Amos Huchstein. Gallant told Huchstein that Hezbollah's continued attacks on Israel were bringing the country closer to a decision regarding military action in Lebanon. In Beirut, Lebanese caretaker Prime Minister Najib Makiti said he expects progress towards the end of the fighting during the month of Ramadan. During a meeting in Beirut this week, Hochstein said that the war between Israel and Hezbollah would not be containable, but added the U.S. remained optimistic about restoring stability in southern Lebanon and northern Israel. And Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced that Israel would not place restrictions on worshippers during the holy fasting month of Ramadan this year. This in the wake of the ongoing war in Gaza and as the security establishment raised concerns that Hamas would try to use the holiday to ignite more violence against Israelis. 
Israel has decided not to impose restrictions on the number of worshippers allowed to pray on the Temple Mount during the first week of the Muslim holiday of Ramadan. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced the decision after meeting with top Israeli security officials who were split on the issue. The Prime Minister's office said that a weekly assessment of the security and safety aspects will be held and adjustments on limitations will be made accordingly. Following the announcement, right-wing National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gvir slammed the decision, saying it would endanger Israelis. The decision to allow a similar ascension to the Temple Mount on Ramadan as in previous years shows that Netanyahu and the limited war cabinet think that nothing occurred on October 7th. He said the decision may also allow an image of victory for Hamas. Each year during Ramadan, hundreds of thousands of Muslim worshippers access the Temple Mount, the site of Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the third holiest site in Islam. Israel has expressed concern that Hamas and the axis of resistance, backed by Iran, will use the fasting holiday this year in the wake of the war to ignite more violence in the region. In previous years, the month of Ramadan was characterized by an increase in violence and attempted terror attacks against Israelis. Just last week, the head of Hamas's political wing, Ismail Haniyeh, called on Palestinians to storm the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the first day of Ramadan and urged them to carry out terror attacks, calling the holiday month a month of jihad. And joining us now with more on the latest security situation across all of Israel's fronts is Alex Trayman, Jerusalem bureau chief at JNS. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Lidar. So lots to cover. Let's start with uh, Gaza. The prospect of a hostage deal seems less and less likely ahead of Ramadan. Uh, so the question remains, why is Israel not advancing in Rafah, maybe exerting more pressure on Hamas? Well, they're certainly operating in the southern Gaza Strip. They're operating very heavily in Khan Yunus. Uh, the international community is hoping to uh, get and uh, have a plan uh, approved whereby uh, Israel can move as many of the residents out of Rafiyah as possible uh, before they go in with heavy fighting. I think that it, it will happen within the next coming weeks. There was uh, the opportunity perhaps to get a, a hostage deal, which, as you mentioned, I, th I think that that is, uh, that that is waning. Um, I do expect that we'll see uh, the attacks inside Rafa in, in the coming weeks. In the coming weeks. And, you know, I want to move now to the Northern Front because a lot's been going on uh, over the past 24 hours. The defense minister and other security uh, officials warning that war with Hezbollah is fast approaching. Uh, we've been waiting for a diplomatic solution for some time now, but that doesn't seem uh, to be advancing either. Uh, now Hezbollah launched really a massive uh, missile attack against Israel uh, in the past 24 hours. So what's your analysis on this front? Well, we've seen really since October 7th that uh, Hezbollah and Israel have been slowly escalating the level of violence. It's hard to see how it can not continue to escalate uh, in the coming days and weeks, but uh, it is clear that that both Israel and Lebanon both are trying to, uh, while escalating on the one hand, trying to avoid that full-scale war in the meantime, on the other hand, um, it, it's, but both sides are, are really playing with fire over here. and and. We've said it for, for weeks and even for months, but it, it does seem as though there's, there's no way to avoid a, a full-scale uh, operation between these two. And is Israel prepared for a multi-front war? And if so, also, you know, there's the question of how the international community will respond uh, to such an event. Well, Israel's been giving as much lip service as possible to the idea of a diplomatic solution, and that uh, actually aids its efforts to gain the traction in the international community. If a diplomatic solution uh, is not made, then Israel can say, look, we've been trying for weeks and months to reach a diplomatic solution, but you see that they continue to escalate their attacks, and they've left us no choice uh, but to go in. At the same time, you mentioned an important component, which is that Israel does not want to fight a multi-front war. They believe that it is better to... Uh, 
finish up the operations in Gaza uh, because you have limited amounts of uh, air power, you have limited numbers of tanks, you have limited number of, of soldiers, and, and if you're going to be fighting in the north, so which soldiers are you taking? Which tanks are you taking? They want to, to, to get everything out of the south first, and that's the reason why they're willing to pay lip service to the diplomatic solution uh, because it gives them time to finish the operations in Gaza. And now I want to look towards uh, Ramadan. You know, Israel uh, has decided, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has decided not to impose restrictions uh, on worshippers uh, at the Temple Mount. The decision uh, tried to balance between sort of security considerations on the one hand and outrage should Israel impose uh, security restrictions. So what does this essentially mean on the ground and how much of a security risk does this now pose to Israel? Well, it's a very big security risk. Uh, the, the Arabs and Hamas have said, you know, even from the beginning of this war, but but for years back, they they launched the war saying that this was the Al Aqsa flood. That was the name of their operation. So they're they're talking about uh, liberating the Temple Mount, and they could potentially be looking to utilize the Temple Mount, get as many Arabs and Hamas supporters as possible to the Temple Mount. Uh, on Ramadan, which has unfortunately been a holy month for killing Jews historically here in the last several years in the state of Israel, uh, and to use it as a launching point for a second uh, October 7th attack. Um, and Israel has been try under a lot of pressure to demonstrate that it protects freedom of worship, but this is freedom of worship during a war. We saw in, in 2021 during the last flare-up that uh, Hamas hung banners, uh, billboards all over the Temple Mount, and they use it as, a, as the fulcrum for incitement against the Jewish people, uh, it's it's a very, very fragile situation. And it could very well be that uh, even though in the beginning they will allow the full amount of worshipers, that uh, it might be a short amount of time uh, over this month-long holiday where they, whereby uh, they reduce significantly the number of worshipers that are allowed up on the mount. Absolutely. I mean, we already saw a terrorist attack today uh, in Jerusalem, and we know that uh, that unfortunately Ramadan uh, brings uh, a lot of violence with it as well. Uh, here in Israel. Alex Trayman, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks for having me. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative, available on the web, Android, and Apple. And moving on, Qatari, Egyptian, and U.S. mediators are continuing a final day of talks in Cairo in what seems like an increasingly doubtful effort to achieve a hostage for truce deal in Gaza ahead of Ramadan. But U.S. President Joe Biden is still sounding optimistic. More on this from ILTV's Steve Leibovitz. The talks for a hostage release for truce deal in Cairo are seemingly bogged down. Hamas is sticking to demands that Israel end the war. But it did agree to keep its negotiators in Cairo at the request of Egyptian and Qatari mediators. Talks have been ongoing in Cairo for two days, though Israel declined to send a delegation after Hamas refused to even provide a list of living hostages. U.S. President Biden said that a deal is in place and Hamas needs to accept a reasonable agreement. I was just saying that the hostage deal is in the hands of Hamas right now okay. because there's been an offer, a rational offer. The Israelis have agreed to it and uh, wait to see what the Hamas does. Do you think it's a by Ramadan? Well, I, there's got to be a ceasefire, because Ramadan, if we get into a circumstance where this continues through Ramadan, Israel and Jerusalem, again, it could be very, very dangerous. So we're looking, we're trying hard for that ceasefire. Biden also said that more aid must enter Gaza. The outline of the deal worked out earlier in the Paris Agreement reportedly includes the release of 40 hostages in exchange for a 40-day pause in fighting and the release of 400 Palestinian security prisoners. Ramadan is due to begin on March 10th. And in a victory speech on Tuesday night following the results of the Super Tuesday Republican primaries, former U.S. President Donald Trump said that had he remained president, Israel would not have been attacked on October 7th. 
Trump swept to victory in statewide primaries, bringing him one step closer to clinching the presidential nomination for the Republican Party and setting up a rematch with U.S. President Joe Biden. Let's take a look. Former U.S. President Donald Trump secured a landslide victory on Super Tuesday, winning the Republican votes in a dozen of states, including California and Texas, and effectively eliminating any hopes for former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, who was able to secure a lone victory in Vermont. This brings the former president one step closer to an historic election against U.S. President Joe Biden in November. In a victory speech, Trump took to the stage criticizing the Biden administration on its failed foreign policy and said that if he had remained president, Israel would never have been attacked. We've watched our country take a great beating over the last three years, and nobody thought a thing like this would be possible. We wouldn't have Russia attacking Ukraine. We wouldn't have Israel being attacked. Iran, as you know, was broke. When I was running things, they were broke. They didn't have money for Hamas. They didn't have money for Hezbollah. Trump not only criticized Biden for his foreign policy, but slammed him for his open border policy, one of the main issues concerning voters in the upcoming presidential elections. Things that are happening now are unthinkable, and they're unthinkable at the border. We have millions of people invading our country. This is an, ev an invasion. This is the worst invasion, probably. We've never had anything like it. No country has ever had anything like it. The number today could be 15 million people. And they're coming from rough places and dangerous places. And we had that shut down. We had everything going so beautifully. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden also swept through Super Tuesday, bringing him one step closer to officially securing the Democratic Party nomination. While the Israel-Gaza war does not seem to be a major issue among most American voters, it has been a point of contention for a vocal minority and a thorn for the U.S. president. On the campaign trial, Biden has encountered protesters from a pro-Hamas voices opposing his policy towards Israel. In Michigan last week and on Tuesday, some voters in states with large Arab and Muslim populations took writing uncommitted on the ballot. Regardless, after Tuesday's result, it seems both candidates will secure their party's nominations, meaning that a Biden-Trump rematch in November is almost certain. And in other news, the Israel Innovation Authority is the body responsible for Israel's innovation policy. It recently held a conference here in ILTV studios to address the challenges and needs of the Israeli tech ecosystem in the wake of October 7th and the ongoing war in Gaza. Here's a little snippet from the conference, an exclusive interview with Dol Bean, the CEO of the Innovation Authority. Hello everyone, I'm Hagar Ravet, and I'm joined here today by Dror Bin, CEO of Israel Innovation Authority. Dror, we are meeting here today in the midst of a very challenging uh, time for the uh, Israeli tech sector. As we sit here today, almost four months since the brutal attack of, of uh, October 7, um, please describe the, the challenges of the Israeli tech I think that the war uh, created a lot of uh, challenges uh, to Israeli tech. Uh, the, the first one is uh, how, you, how do you continue and deliver uh, while there is a war situation. Uh, after all, every Israeli tech company is very dependent on the global markets. Uh, you either have a global investor or a global customer or uh, partners. All of them are in the global markets. Israel is a very tiny market, so every startup here from the very first day thinks about the global markets. Uh, so uh, sustaining the confidence of those partners abroad was uh, crucial. Uh, unfortunately, Israeli uh, entrepreneurs and uh, uh, executives are very used to such uh, crisis times. Uh, we, had, uh, we have such a crisis every few years whether it's uh, because of uh, macro, global macroeconomic uh, conditions or uh, security issues or corona. So they are very resilient. They know how to operate uh, their business uh, during such uh, demanding times. Um, I think that I spoke uh, since the war broke with hundreds of uh, entrepreneurs and CEOs and investors. All of them are very focused on uh, delivering the, on their commitments to customers, on uh, delivering their R&D plans. 
And this is, I think, why uh, the campaign and the slogan of, slogan of uh, Israeli tech delivers, no matter what, was uh, brought to life. Uh, maybe the largest uh, or the most uh, challenging one was uh, financing. Many of the early stage uh, startups in Israel were caught in the middle of a financing round. Uh, we did uh, a survey just, uh, I think it was a week or two after the war broke, and realized that something like 60% of the early stage startups have a runway of less than six months to go. And uh, how do you raise money in the middle of a war when uh, investors are saying, hold on, I want to see what's going on before I put uh, my money. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think it was three weeks after the war broke, we launched a, a fund, a financing bridging fund, to make sure that uh, all those early stage startups with short runways have enough money to continue operation. So very quick response from the Innovation Authority, uh, but you also took a few weeks to, to study the market and you have uh, new innovation going forward as an answer to the, to the current crisis, right? Since uh, the high-tech is so crucial to the success of the Israeli economy, we want to make sure that we don't uh, wait and see how things evolve and then uh, act. We prefer to act on advance, and this is why we declared uh, two new funds. One is uh, Yozma Fund, which uh, targets uh, the venture capital funds, uh, the local uh, venture capital funds. We want to make sure they have enough funds to continue investing in early-stage uh, startups. And so this is a strategic move uh, that uh, is going to be launched in early Q2. And uh, in addition to that, uh, we are launching another fund which is uh, focused and targeted at deep tech ventures. We believe Israel has a great potential in solving uh, the great uh, challenges of humanity in uh, just think about climate change or uh, how do you provide health care services to growing and aging population in the world. We are not out of the woods yet. Uh, what do you think about the uh, uh, Israeli tech industry's ability uh, to rebound after the war? Well, as you said, uh, we are still uh, in the midst uh, of the war and no one knows how it will uh, evolve. There, are very, there is such a variety of scenarios we can uh, think about. Uh, but uh, as I said before, uh, looking backwards uh, from all previous uh, downturns and uh, crises, uh, Israeli tech uh, just uh, got stronger. And uh, we hope, and as I just uh, explained, we also act in order to make sure that also in this case, uh, Israeli tech will rise stronger from this uh, wartime. Uh, and this is always an opportunity when the valuation goes down. It's an opportunity for uh, smart investors to go in and find uh, those uh, good things that they should invest in. Uh, so, yes, I believe uh, there are many such opportunities today in Israel. Uh, and we are open to, for business. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dror. We hope for a quieter, better days. Indeed. Thank you very much for watching us today. And now, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Partly cloudy skies are expected tonight around the country with temperatures reaching lows of about 11 degrees Celsius or 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Then tomorrow, partly cloudy skies and light rain in the north with temperatures sitting at highs of 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our ILTV channel, subscribe to our ILTV newsletter, and don't forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.tv, with all the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Madar Gavelazi. Be well, stay safe, and thank you so much for watching.